Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thank you, Dawson, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. So today's guest is author Philip Jett, who was born here uh, in Union City. He's uh, an incredible writer, and he writes just the kind of books that I uh, love to read. He was a corporate and tax attorney advising Fortune 500 corporations and some of the biggest names in sports and entertainment. But then he retired and turned to write. He is now a New York Times acclaimed author and an international speaker. Welcome, Philip. So, um, Philip, I know we talked about your last book, um, The Taking Mr. X on the Kidnapping of an Oil Giant's President. Uh, how did, how did the uh, uh, promotional tour and all that go for that book? Was it a lot of fun to talk about? It was okay. You know, the, it. It was during COVID, so it was impacted greatly um, during COVID. Uh, And, you know, to tell you the truth, it wasn't a lot of fun because of that fact. Um, You know, one of the perks of writing books is to get to meet people, uh, you know, and talk with people like yourself and to travel. And um, the second book, the first book I had that, The the Death of an Heir, um, you know, I premiered it in Denver and went to Colorado Springs and Boulder and that sort of thing, really saturated Colorado because of the topic, which was about Adolf Coors III. And that was a blast. That was a lot of fun. You know, I was on TV out there, radio, print. And, uh, but with the second book, and you know, we delayed it, but COVID just hung in there, you know, and it wouldn't give up. And so I didn't have as much fun. I did a lot, a lot of online things. Um, but not uh, travel. It was, I, I don't think, uh, I'm trying to remember. I went up to New Jersey later on and hung out with some FBI folks. And uh, we had a party up there. And, uh, but that was about it. You know, there wasn't a lot going on for that book, which is a shame. But hopefully COVID's in the closet for a while. Well, there was a, there was a, a documentary. I'm trying, not a documentary, a, a movie. I think it was on HBO about uh, the kidnapping of, uh, some uh million some billionaire's grandson and i thought about you because i thought hey yes that was it that was it and i thought hey this would make a good a good uh, movie as well so yeah you know the what i because i really enjoy meeting people uh and i think that's something that i've done as i've grown older because when i practiced law that was not the case um but as a writer and having grown older, I really enjoy meeting people. With the first two books being true crime, which were kidnapping, murder, families did not want to talk to you. You know, if if they were the victim's family or the perpetrator's families, they didn't want to talk to you. They just wanted you to go away. Uh, they were trying to put it behind them. But I met a lot of FBI, local police, state police, diplomatic service people, those kind of people. And I made friends, lasting friends, you know. Um, uh, and now with The Strand in the Sky, which is a historical book about, uh, you know, I tell it from the perspective of the crew members and the passengers and the families of those folks that I, you know, I interviewed because I went back and I got passenger lists for these planes. There's four planes involved in the book and I got passenger lists. And then I did a genealogy search uh, for all the passengers and I got names of people and mailed letters and made contact with several people that were the children, you know, even though the children now are in their 70s and 80s. um, And they sent me pages from diaries, copies of documents, photos, all kinds of things. So, you know, I pick out about 12 individuals that I follow throughout the book and um, and even 
more are mentioned. There's a lot of folks that are mentioned. Well, these people have embraced me um, like never before. I'm not accustomed to, you know, they're thanking me for telling the story. They're so pleased. You know, I'm debuting it in San Francisco on Saturday at the old Pan Am terminal on Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay of all places. And most of these people live in the Bay Area. So they're coming, they're bringing family. It's And it's almost like rather than a book a premiere, it's more like a tribute or a celebration almost of these people that are in the book and their family. And I have never had so much uh, in the way of, you know, nice things and gratitude coming from these folks. And it, it's really humbling. So for folks who are listening who aren't familiar, your book is Stranded in the Sky. Luke himself here, our producer, is a pilot, and so he's really interested in, in okay. uh, about planes. So tell us a little bit about exactly what the book is about. Yeah, the title is Stranded in the Sky, the untold story of Pan Am luxury airliners trapped on the day of infamy. So it's by its very nature a war book, but it's not – its focus is not a war book. Um, so what happened was we all we're all familiar, hopefully, with December 7, 1941, the Empire Empire of Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, but they also attacked many islands as part of a coordinated effort on that same day, you know, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Guam, Wake Island, Midway. I mean, you name it, they were attacking it. And it was all within a few hours of each. Um and they were attacking American, British, and Dutch um, bases. Well, Pan Am, Pan American Airways at that time, was the only airline in, in the world that flew internationally across the oceans. They flew across the Atlantic and the Pacific. And at that time, the World War II in Europe was already going on. So they had curtailed most of their flights to Europe, and they were focusing on flights to you know, the Orient to New Zealand, Australia, uh, Hawaii, uh, that type of thing. And these planes were look super luxurious by today's standards. They were, first of all, they were about three levels high. Um, they had a bar. They had four course meals. They had berths like sleeping on a train or a um, passenger um, uh, liner, steam liner. And they had um, just all these amenities, uh, and they had sofas, and and it's hard to imagine. That, you know, the book has 60 photos, which are dispersed throughout where it's relevant. And to see these planes, it was just amazing to me. First of all, I did not realize that Pan Am flew over the oceans in the 30s and into the 40s. And... Um, that these planes were available and they were really only available for the wealthy. Uh, for instance, to fly from San Francisco to Hong Kong and back in 1941 would cost about two grand just for one seat. To, in that today's dollars, that's about 35 grand. Um, and if you can imagine, and even more than that, some of these folks, if they were traveling as a family would, would reserve an entire cabin, which might be, you know, 12 grand in, in 1941 dollars. Um, and, and even more than that, there was a deluxe suite on the tail that had its, like a, its own bed, its own, uh, sofa, love seat, chairs, bathroom, that, and that was about a hundred grand in 1941 dollars. Um, you know, it, it's just astounding. So you had celebrities, you had, you know, Standard Oil uh, execs. You had, you know, the the, the top people uh, on these planes. So they're so they're taking off on December seventh, or you know, December third, fourth, fifth, venturing out over the Pacific. And it's like woohoo! You know, we're going to these exotic places. We're you know having a great vacation, just like people do today. And the next thing you know, the pilot tells the passengers, you know. Everything's being attacked, and we're right in the middle of it, uh, out over the Pacific Ocean. So now you go from 
you know, all this hoopla and excitement about your destination to how are we going to survive this? And, um, you know, and that's really the focus of the book. And I, as I say, I pick out four planes. I really concentrate on two primarily. And, um, and I follow um, the passengers and, you know, picked out about a dozen passengers in particular and give you their background and their family situation and their children at home and their wife at home or whatever, you know, that's all these concerns. So I try to build up anticipation about what may happen to these individuals. And at the same time, I'm I'm leaking in the Japanese throughout the book. So it, I, I, I compare it to kind of like the Jaws, you know, where the music starts. You know, when the book starts, everybody's boarding these planes, everything's fun. So you go three or four chapters in, the next thing you see is that Japanese have left Japan headed for these islands. And so, you know, now you've got the um, the Japanese out there and people unbeknownst are out there having fun. And so you go three or four more chapters in having fun on these beautiful planes and these islands and the Japanese are getting closer. You know, and so so it, it finally converges uh, with Pearl Harbor and then the aftermath of not only Pearl, but all these other islands. Um, and, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but for instance, out of the four planes, one is shot up um, pretty badly. I think it had 23 bullet holes in the side um, and the other was bombed and burned. Um, and. Um, and some of these folks could not get back. The, it's funny, the crew members and the surviving planes would, they were, that was the focus because the United States government military is like, we need pilots and we need planes. You know, forget about passengers. You know, it's like, this is what we need right now. Uh, so try your best to get back. And, and I uh, read where, I read where there were as many crew members as there were passengers. I know it was, it was crazy. Um, these planes could hold up to 72 passengers, but they rarely did because if they were flying overnight, you had birds. So <clears throat> you could only have about 36 passengers who could sleep in these because the, the chairs and everything would fold into, you know, sleeping accommodations, which were very nice. You know, each berth had its own window, its own light, its own intercom, its own music, you know, speaker and and all that sort of thing. Um, so it wasn't like they were just throwing these people in. You know, it was very nice. So they couldn't fly unless it was a day flight. They could only fly about 36 max. And even then, um, uh, the flights weren't always full. And so you would have... Uh, Sometimes on this flight, you only needed about five or six crew members, but they would do a double shift. So they might have 11 or 12 on there so some could sleep. Because if you're flying from San Francisco to the Orient, it might take five days. And and these planes could not make it, you know, back then. The, the technology was such that they had to island hop. And Pan Am, which is discussed in the book and also photos, Pan Am went on to like Midway, they island hop from San Francisco to Midway, <clears throat> to Wake Island, to Guam, to Manila, to Hong Kong. So they would hop and they would spend the night at each location. And so for the islands that didn't have nice hotels, Pan Am built them. Pan Am built five-star hotels on these little. So you have Wake Island, which is about two and a half square miles of area. It's a tiny little island. And it's got this five-star hotel on it, you know, that nobody goes to other than Pan Am passengers. Um, so the book really is about the, not only the planes, but in the islands and the passengers, but it's also about, of course, the attack and, and the aftermath and the survival and how do we get home. So there's a lot going on in this book that I, I wanted readers to get because I feel like I'm pretty knowledgeable about history, but yet I didn't know Pan Am flew overseas then. I didn't know how they did it. I didn't know about these planes, that sort of well, thing. Well, that that's one of my questions is I'm curious, at what point did you 
A, hear about it or read about this particular incident and what sparked your thought? This might make a good book and what went into deciding whether or not to pursue that idea? You know, it's a great, great question because my first two books just kind of fell in my lap. The first book, Death of an Air, just fell in my lap and it had never, I like to write about things that have not been written about. And the the first book had not, the second, and the third book, Strand in the Sky, has not been written about as comprehensively as I've done. And only certain planes, uh, I've thrown in four, all four planes and with passengers, you know, nobody ever had passenger names and that sort of thing. Uh, but the way it came about, and it may sound somewhat snooty, but it, it, I was um, in Greece in, in 2019, pre-COVID. And I'm sitting on a beach and um, I'm thinking, I've got, I've got to write another book. Um, what would this be about? And out in the uh, ocean, there was a little island. And it was a some type of tourist spot. So this little tourist boat would go back and forth all day as I'm sitting there. And I'm like, you know, I'd like to write a book about an island because something, you know, something that involved an island. It was just that simple. So sitting on a beach in Greece, I take out my cell phone and I start researching. You know, technology is crazy, you know. So I start researching this and I find um, these islands and then I come across Midway and I'm like, yeah, we all know about Midway, you know, in the World War II. But then I saw um, Pan Am and I'm like, wait a minute, what's Pan Am got to do with Midway in 1941? And so that opened up the the curiosity and the digging and and coming across the story. It, it, was, it was just as simple and strange as that, that. I just said to myself, I want to write a book about an island, and then it evolves into to this book. So, um, yeah, it, what's interesting is uh, there's really not a ton out there about this topic, and I can't think of anything that would make a better movie, right? Yeah, I'm thinking that. You know, I need you as a manager, man. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I've had some – you know, I've had um, – and there are a few – uh, blurbs on the book, but there are there are authors who write a lot of World War II books and a lot of military books, and and one even said, "Who who would have thought of this?" You know, they're kind of like we. And uh, another um, author who's a bestseller, he said, "This is the rare rarest of books. It's a an untold story in World War II." said how many of those are out there you know and uh, so i was fortunate and you know it, i just came across the connection of pan am to midway and my mind clicked be only because of my ignorance not knowing pan am was an international airline you know from the 30s um and um and one thing led to another and once i saw they were involved in the attack. My mind snapped and it's like, okay, this would be a great story from the passenger crew member standpoint, you know, as a survival of, you know, of the attack. Well, you think about, you know, you think it was a, the, the whole experience was harrowing for the people that were on uh, the plane. I know the Pacific Clipper, um, their record for the longest commercial flight by mileage still stands today. So it was a long way to go even today. Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Each plane had its own story, uh, and some were in more danger than the other. And, and, but all of them accomplished things that, you know, it's funny. And I say this in the epilogue, I believe, that if they had done it, um, at a time where war didn't start, they probably would have gotten a ticker tape parade in in New York, you know, because they were setting all these amazing, as you say, the Pacific Clipper flew, you know, around the globe um, pretty much at a time where that was not done by a big lumbering commercial plane. You know, you had the Amelia Earharts and, and these specialized planes that were doing that. And these people... You know, they, they didn't have tools. They've had to fashion their own tools and they pick up drums of oil along the way and they fly on automobile gasoline for a while and 
just all this crazy stuff that today you wouldn't you wouldn't do. But each plane had its own uh, story, and um, and like the plane you're talking about, the Pacific Clipper, uh, the first officer I spoke with his son. And he said, you know, my dad didn't think much about it at the time, but as he grew older, he really realized what they had accomplished. And, um, and, you know, and at his death, he was very proud of what they had done. And as you say, it still stands, um, you know, and that was at a time where you didn't have satellite imagery, you didn't have weather reports, you didn't have all the stuff, the support that you have today. Um. I know it was a long, long time ago. Were there any little kids on the planes? So that, is there anybody still alive? There is. Thanks for asking. And he's going to be at the signing, believe it or not, um, in San Francisco. And I'm really excited about it. Um, there's two gentlemen, in, in fact. Um, there's one gentleman. There's, he's probably close to 100 uh, who's going to be there. And there, but uh, one that I've really uh, communicated a lot with, his father was Pan Am's manager on Wake Island. So his job, his father's job was to make sure all the uh, navigation equipment, antennas and, and everything was operational. He would greet the planes when they landed, that sort of thing. So you had an island um, that was pretty sparse. And but and certainly no families, but his family lived there. So this gentleman who's going to be at the event, he was a toddler at the time and he was there. He he said that they were evacuated two weeks before the attack. He and by he they he meant he and his little brother and his mom, his dad stayed. And um, so, you know, he he has no memories of it, but he was physically there. And I said, you know, I think you're probably the only person on the planet who can say that, that you were on Wake Island in the beginning of December, 1941. And, you know, were was a part of all of that, you know, his dad escaped um, and, and they eventually made it back to San Francisco, but yeah, there, there are those people. And, um, then there are those that were, you know, uh, their dad continued to fly for Pan Am, uh, even, you know, flying um, 707s and, and that sort of thing. So Pan Am was a part of the family, even in later years. So um, we're going to take a quick break. But when we get back, um, I want to talk a little bit more about your process as a writer and how you do what you do. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who called West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner, and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is author Philip Jett. So it's the, the topic of uh, your book is so uh, interesting. It's something that you don't read a lot. Uh, and you mentioned the photos. And I'm really curious about your process that you go through uh, when you write a book like this. I know uh, uh, you and I are both fans of Eric Larson. And, you know, I think The Devil in White City is probably one of my favorite mm-hmm. um, books. Um, and he is a real big, been a real big inspiration for me and the stuff I write. Um, And so I have my process. I'm assuming everybody has a different one. Tell me a little bit about how you go from sitting on an island in Greece and thinking, hmm, this would be a good book to uh, publishing. Yeah, well, thank you. First, Eric Larson. Yeah, he's a favorite of mine and also an inspiration. And it's funny, he is a, a Twitter friend of mine, and he actually sought me out, which was strange. 
Um, and so he and I communicated occasionally about things. And he was the one who told me that this is the rarest of birds, a story uh, that has not been told about World War II. So he's been very kind. Oh, my um, gosh. I'm so jealous. That's amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, you know, but, uh, so, I'm, you know, I'm going to continue to suck up to him and I'll send him a free book and whatever I can do. But no, he, he's really good. He's been doing this for a long time. And, you know, there were a couple of his books that when I first started writing, I thought I wanted to write. And Devil in the White City is is was one of them. And uh, the one in the Galveston, um, Isaac Storm, I think, was another one. Um, so I'm like, dang, this guy's beating me to the, you know, punch, or, you know. So, but I don't view him. Certainly, I'm not a threat to his career in any way. But um, I view him as, and one one line I used yesterday, I was on television in Nashville, believe it or not, uh, for, you know, a whopping maybe five minutes to plug the book. <clears throat> And I brought up Eric Larson. I said, you know, because someone asked me, they asked me in the interview about my research. And I remember hearing Eric Larson say, someone asked him, I think I actually read it on on, um, Twitter, that do you have a staff that does your research for you? And he's like, I have a staff, but why let them have all the fun? And that's certainly me. I really enjoy the research. And I think that just comes naturally for me. I learned a lot of methods of research, practicing law, of course, but it's the curiosity and it's the wanting to find that fact that no one else has found. And um, and just, you know, wanting to put a book out there that nobody can say, hey, this is wrong, you know. So I'm I'm a real nerd when it comes to my research and for this book um you know you put feelers out and you try to see what you've got uh and a lot of times you know the agencies you reach out to or the archives are not helpful so you have to adjust and this one um you know i i took the time i flew to new york uh, san francisco miami dc i did the library of congress i did the national archives i did you know um uh, airport museums. I did every, you know, anything I could find. Miami has all of the University of Miami has all of uh, Pan Am's records. Uh, when Pan Am went out of business, they were donated to the University of Miami. So those are there. So I spent a lot of time and, and the, you know, with this story, there's a, there was a mountain of, of stuff. And so you have to decide how am I going to organize and what's my story? You know, what, how am I going to hone this down into something that's manageable? And for me, I'm like, okay, I got four planes. Let's do four stories. And so my first draft, I wrote following each plane. Well, um, I quickly found that, number one, the book was too long. And number two, it was, you know, difficult to keep up and and know who you're with at the time. The book is unwieldy. So even though I loved every word of it, I had to cut it. Um, And unfortunately, some of the people I interviewed, you know, their parents were cut down to maybe just a mention instead of being a character. And I had to break that to them. But um, so, you know, it depends on the book, you know, with Coors, um, my first book, Death of an Air, uh, it took a while because I had to go through the FBI archives. And they're very slow, and then they redact a lot of things, but then they don't redact. Um, and then you have to go to courts and libraries and all kinds of things. And this one, it was actually a little easier because, I, you know, I'll do a plug here. I used Ancestry.com, uh, which I didn't realize the power of that because I would go over to, like, Vanderbilt's University here and try to get newspapers from South China and all kinds of things, you know, it was coming up empty. And, but Ancestry has so much, and that's where I got the passenger list. I tried to get the passenger list from government agencies and that was just not going to happen. And, and I'm like, believe it or not, I got them off Ancestry. And then you look up the folks and you follow them and then you send them letters. So that, I, I hate 
to keep doing a plug, but ancestry was invaluable to me. I could not have written this book without that, that site. And, um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also curious. So when you're researching, um, do you just like, you know, I found my phone to be a really valuable tool to take pictures of articles and, you know, say stuff. I end oh, up yeah. with boxes oh, yeah. and boxes. And then do you find yourself somewhere needing something that, you know, you have somewhere and you spend hours looking back through stuff? Or are you organized enough in the front end where you don't have to do that? No, no. I'm just like that. And it's scary that your mind is able to do that. Because you'll be like, <clears throat> you'll be writing and you're like, you know, I know I've read something about this particular thing. And now I know what did I do with it? You know, did I photo do a photo, you know, screenshot? Did I download it? Did I whatever did, you know, a librarian send it to me? Did, so then you start scouring. Uh, and most of the time I do a good job with folders and have everything, but every once in a while something is out there, you know, it, it's gone rogue, it's crawled out of the folder and it's gone somewhere and it drives me crazy, you know, I'll be up all night if I have to, to find it. But Were there any kind of, uh, like, other than finally finding the passenger list on Ancestry, were there any kind of, like, aha moments where you did, like, fireworks went off for you? Um, You know, um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there was. And I think a lot of times, you know, my process has always has been write the first draft and then interview. Um, I don't interview before I write the first draft because I'm not sure what I'm going to need. Um, and usually the interviews are not, they don't give you a lot of information. They give you anecdotes. They give you feeling. They give you personality. They give you that stuff that you can insert later. Um, so, um, every once in a while, someone would tell me something that was funny or, you know, about their dad or, or, you know, um, for instance, one guy, his mother, uh, on the Pacific Clipper, um, you know, they didn't hear from them for over a month. I think it took 31 days. So mom, you know, he's like, mom was sitting at home with two kids, you know, didn't know where dad was and nobody was going to tell her. and. And her quote, which I got was, you know, heck, this was, there was a war on, you know, it, you know, it, it, it was uh, a military secret. It, it was so funny because the, like today versus then it was just accepted that you don't have a right to know, you know, and you just got to wait. And, and you're one of many, you know, who's serviceman or whatever out there. Um, and I found, you know, so things like that I would find interesting just from the culture of the time um, versus today. And, you know, I, I found some interesting things that that were not pertinent to the book. Uh, for instance, when I was in San Francisco, I was at the National Archives out there and they had a lot of original, um, you know, you had to put the white gloves on. They had a lot of original uh, telegrams and things between Roosevelt and Pearl and, um, you know, about the attack and, and, and things like that, um, that I, I just found, you know, it was just amazing to me to see it and, and like, wow, this telegram was actually sent. And, and what's also funny is there were telegrams about the Clippers. For instance, the uh, Philippine Clipper was flying back to Pearl came back um let's see came back the next day um and there were telegrams being sent around pearl saying don't you know the philippine clipper is coming in around 11 a.m do not shoot it down <laughs> you know kind of thing and so you're seeing these telegrams and i put stuff like that in the book that you know I, it, it's not particularly that important it's just it makes you feel a part, you know, of that moment, you know, um, when you see things that are genuine. 
Well, I have a I have a promotion idea for you. We we both talked about Eric uh, Larson, another writer that really his book really kind of changed my life in a lot of ways. Is James L. Swanson wrote Manhunt, the twelve day chase for Lincoln's killer. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. ever read that, but if you haven't, I really recommend you get it and read it. Um, okay, back in two thousand seven at this point, but they actually at the museum where I would eventually go work long before I went to work there, they had an exhibit based on his book about Lincoln. And and honestly, seeing that exhibit and buying the book is what made me want to start researching history and writing about it. And so it really uh, changed my life. Um, I think, I know that your opening, your your big opening party is at the Treasure Island Museum, which um, for those who don't know, uh, part of the original Pan American uh, terminal uh, from San Francisco Bay is there. So, but that would be a great exhibit. Your book would be a great inspiration for an exhibit for them to, um, to mount for the public. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, they're going to keep my book there. Um, and it's funny, somebody just built a replica of the China Clipper, uh, a gentleman that's almost a hundred years old. That's going to be there. Uh, he's not a part of my book, but we're doing this kind of, he's doing it kind of the, what are they like the the band that warms up? You know, he's 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 doing his thing with and they're unveiling this China Clipper, which is meticulously done. It's amazing, you know. And he actually saw the China Clipper when he was young. So uh he's going to be there. And but you know, they they've told me that they want to keep my book there available. And there's you know, there's the San Francisco Museum at the airport. They have a lot of Pan Am. Uh, stuff as well and they're going to do the same um, which is an honor for me that you know they may incorporate my book as part of their story to tell Um, and um, Garden City New York um, is doing the same Um, that's where Charles Lindbergh took off uh, on his famous flight and they've made a museum there and Pan Am is a big part of it as well so I stopped by there uh, when I was in New York and uh, but I must say, um, and this is for Luke. I know he's listening um, and is the pilot. Um, there's um, uh, two weeks ago, I took a flight aboard a 1928 Ford trimotor, um, flew around for half an hour out, of, you know, near Nashville. Well, and you, it was do that at Tullahoma. Yeah, that's great. It was it was a treat. Cool. I was trying to make it out there to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, Pan Am used those early on uh, for its uh, South and Central America flights out of Miami. They never used them, of course, because um, they were short range planes. But it's funny. Uh, I was just sitting around, and, and that came across my desk that they were going to be out here giving flights for you know they they go across the country. And they're they're at each location for about three days, so I got aboard this thing, and my older son's like, "Dad, is your will in order?" You know, and I'm like, "No, nah, this thing's great." And um, so, you know, and it was great. I, it was a thrill for me. Um, just the sound of the you know three big you know propellers and everything, and the and the seating and everything. You know, the wood grain interior, and it was all a lot of fun and. But uh, I can only imagine what it was like to fly on these planes. But um, uh, so, yeah, I got to do that. And that was a that was a big thrill. That's awesome. So- Luke has a really interesting project that has to do with airplanes and photography. Um, we want, It's not time to divulge that yet. It's still a big secret. Oh. But, but I do want to know, tell us a little bit about all the pictures that you have in the book. What was the process like for gathering those together? And how did you pick uh, which ones to include and which ones not to? Yeah, good question. You know, and I'll revert to my <clears throat> earlier books. Um, for instance, my first book, um, I had a little secret because most, you know, as you know, most uh, photos are copyrighted now, you know, and and they're owned and you have to license them and all that sort of thing. So a lot of times you're thwarted in your mission to get photos. But in the Coors case, for instance, uh, the Denver Post had lots of photos, but they were not going to let me use them for free. And fortunately for me, unfortunately for the newspaper, the Rocky Mountain Times had gone out of business uh, not long before and had donated all of their 
newspapers and photos to the Denver Public Library. So I was able to access those photos for free, just, you know, that you just mentioned in the caption for each photo that it was, you know, came from the Denver Public Library. On this, yeah, exactly. And um, in this case, um, you know, I haven't gone to so many museums and then Miami having uh, most of this stuff was, you know, fair use. It was, uh, had been part of the records. It was not owned by a newspaper or Getty or any of that sort of thing. So it was, you know, all I had to do was figure out what photos I wanted, where they were located, shoot an email and say, hey, I would love to use these photos. I will credit your organization or your museum. And they were all very lovely and said, of course. And uh, although I, 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 I won't name one, I, I actually reached out to a company uh, about a certain photo, a private company, and they put me in charge. They, they, they connected me to their lawyer, their corporate lawyer, and then their lawyer had to review, you know, parts of the book and all this kind of stuff. And it took forever. So I finally said, you know, just forget it. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. <laughs> but, you know, it was just over an old photo. Um, so some, but uh, most of the time, you know, certainly in the museum and the archives and, you know, at the Library of Congress, you got, you got, you can use those. And so, uh, so I look at, you know, a gazillion photos and they're to me they're all a treasure and um and and you just say okay this is a story um i want to i want to tell it with the photos and the publisher was great because usually what happens in my first two books they just do like a centerfold where they they put the photos in the middle and they're in you know and they're in order but if you're reading the book and you get halfway and then you look at the photos, it kind of ruins the last half because you just saw all the photos. Well, th this publisher allowed me not only to have 60 photos, which is a lot of photos, um, they allowed me to place them where it's pertinent in the text. So uh, so as you're reading, you look up and you see the photo that matches, you know, the text of the book and which is great. Um, because if I'm telling you about, you know, a three hour brunch of, of, you know, ham and Virginia ham and, and baked Alaska and all that, there's a photo of guys in, you know, white coats and gloves serving this you know, buffet, you know, and, and on and on. And, and, um, so the photos I think are a real treat, um, and at least for me, because in my first two books, I think I had a dozen photos and 60 photos um, in and they're all crisp and clear and, you know, they tell a lot of story. I even have a photo of that I got from a, a Japanese um, museum of that was taken by a Japanese pilot coming in to attack the Hong Kong Clipper and the actual bullets being fired at it. So I got it. And, um, you know, that's a pretty rare photo uh, as well. So, well, it's a beautiful book. The cover's uh, really pretty as well. Uh, did they, did you go, did they send you the cover, the publisher, and you say you hit the nail on the head, or was there an evolution on what ended up being the cover? There, it was a little, it was a little evolution, not a lot. Um, I think we did in a couple of days. I had a photo. Um, uh, I had the photo of that plane and, the, and everything that's on the cover. And it was actually in color. Uh, there weren't many color photos. Um, and of course, all the photos in the book are black and white. But so I had this beautiful cover, um, what I thought would be a cover photo, and I sent it to them. And I and my agent and I had worked on the title. And, you know, I had kicked around hiding in the sky uh and he's like well what about this and then we ended up stranded in the sky so he, my agent and i worked out the title and and came up with the subtitle which subtitles are so funny they're so long but they they have to tell kind of what the book's about you know uh so uh i send the photo to the editor at the publisher and i'm like hey this is what i'd, I'd like for us to use this photo here's the title here's the subtitle what do you think and they come back, you know, and they're like, yeah, great. Um, 
let me give this to our art guy and we'll get back to you. And they get back and the art person had the clever idea to make it look old, um, you know, and to to have the background as a Japanese flag, you know, with the, the sun, the beams of the sun coming out. And so um, I'm like, yeah, OK, can we and then I'm like, can we add a banner with the subtitle? Like, yeah. So he comes back and he's got one. And then I'm like, yeah, it looks good. It looks good. I'm like, but it looks like they're just flying over San Francisco. You know, it doesn't really. I say, can we add like little planes? And I drew these little planes like, <laughs> you know, and I sent it to him. Well, he did something better, but he used the idea and put these like Japanese zeros coming in, even though they weren't attacking the plane over San Francisco. But it gives the reader more of a, a picture. So, yeah, it was a process, but they were very... um very uh, open to my suggestions and that just depends on the publisher you know um sometimes you get one that's like yeah this is it and i'm like well that doesn't make any sense and they're like but yeah this looks good you know or we had our committee of people you know whatever uh so but yeah i was very proud of of the cover and it's interesting that you can see the terminal the exact building where i'm going to be saturday in on the cover um you know and um uh, that's very exciting i had someone email me today whose uh, father was on the uh anzac clipper and she said i cannot believe i'm so excited this lady is probably around 80. she's like i cannot believe that i'm going to be in the same building that my father walked in you know in 1941 and so it means a lot to certain people and it does to me as well oh yeah and i mean this is things like this make history come to life you know that's why yeah. books like this are so important um i wish you luck on your big opening event i'm sure you'll be posting pictures on uh facebook so we can see oh yeah oh uh, yeah see, see what happens i'm excited to see that i know how important the, a good successful book launch is so so good luck on that and if anybody well, wants you. to buy the book uh they can go to amazon and fortunately there aren't enough there aren't a lot of similar titles so you can just search stranded in uh -huh. the sky and it comes right up yeah it's also available at other places as well, like Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Target, you know, but, you know, I'm kind of an Amazon guy, but I try not to plug anyone. And of course, your independent pub, uh, bookstores as well um, couldn't get it for you. But fortunately, it's available. It's like the 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 wording wherever books are sold, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in Kindle, hardcover and paperback. Is that it right? is. And, you know, that's, that's another great thing, you know, because usually you got to go one to the next to the next. And this time we had a shotgun approach, a uh, hardcover paperback ebook, you know, and uh, there's some talk about an audio version, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Are you thinking about what the next book is going to be about? Not only am I thinking about it, I've already, already written the first draft. Um, and I've taken the last two months off, uh, to let it sit. And, you know, it's kind of like cooking. You, you cook the book and then you let it simmer for a while. You want to extract yourself and your mind from it. And then you want to come back and approach it and, and see how it feels to you again, you know? Um, and this book is unusual for me and, you know, we'll see if it's, uh, going to be good or a flop. It's fiction. I've, you know, so I've gone from three and uh, nonfiction books, uh, two true crime, one historical nonfiction, to a totally fictional book uh, that I had a blast writing. And um, my agent was like, no, 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 no. You know, this is not the way you do it. You know, we're branding you as nonfiction, kind of like Eric Larson, Eric Larson Jr., you know. And I'm like, eh, that's OK, but. You know, I'm really doing this for fun, and and I'm getting a tad bored uh, writing the nonfiction, and I want to try my hand at fiction. And if it's a bust, then I'll go back to nonfiction. So I've written this book, and it it involves um, a couple things that my life has encountered that I've incorporated, which most fiction writers do. First of all. It involves kidnapping, of course, from my first two books. It involves an international kidnap negotiator. 
which these guys usually are coming out of Lloyd's of London and they go about the world and negotiate ransoms that none of us know about. Um, and sometimes they put themselves in harm's way. Um, and it also introduces you to the equestrian world uh, at Palm Beach, where um, I've been involved in the last few years. And uh, the person who is kidnapped is an equestrian uh, of a wealthy individual down there because, you know, the usually the children of like Bill Gates, Bruce Springsteen, you know, um, who, all these, you know, even Tom Bray's uh, daughters down there now. So it's like a who's who of, of famous um, um, kids of famous parents. So anyway, the book starts with a kidnapping from dad and, and you know, ends up in, involving several countries and super yachts. And it's a lot of fun. Well, it's about time for you to have another book signing uh, here in Union City. For those who don't know, uh, Philip was the uh, valedictorian of O'Brien <laughs> County Central High School. So uh, you have a lot of friends here, I know. And so I when, do, you get, I do. when you get ready to promote that book, why don't you uh, make a plan to stop by here at Discovery Park and have a book signing party? I would love to do that. Let's We'll talk about that. I would love to do that. I always like to come home. And yeah, you know, i I grew up in Sandburg, for those who, you know, at Realfoot Lake, and um, went to Hornbeak Elementary School, went to O'Brien County Central, and then on, um, and feel like, you know, I, I still cherish um, that childhood. I had a lot of opportunities to do fun things as a kid uh, that my kids have not had living in a big city suburb. Um so, yeah, you know, it's still my mom still says when you're coming home, uh, even though I haven't been there since I was 18. But, uh, yeah, it's still home. And this particular book uh, that we've been talking about is dedicated to your sister, I noticed. It is. Yes. My sister passed away in September um, suddenly. And, and um, yeah, that was a. Uh, that was tough for all of us. And, uh, you know, because I keep thinking I'm a young man. And, uh, you know, everybody else seems to counter that. But, yeah, it's ded dedicated to my sister, Paulette. And, um, and uh, you know, I'm running out of people to dedicate. I keep writing books. I, you know, I'm going to have to get my dog in there before long. <laughs> you can dedicate the next one to Discovery Park of America. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. You know, well, I thank will. you. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us about your book. And thank you so much for writing it. Because I think, you know what, things like that, some some unsuspecting young person may pick that book up and decide to fall in love with history. Well, you you never know. And, you know, it's 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 fun for me. And, and this one was almost a privilege, uh, especially when you meet these people that I'm going to be seeing in San Francisco. I mean, they, you know, their parents were a part of history and they are so proud of them. And um, so, yeah, I, I appreciate your kind words and um, we'll see how it goes, you know, um, and, and then we'll try out the fiction and see how that goes. Well, I'll, I'll buy that one, too. Oh, you're nice. Thank you, Luke. And thank you, Scott. And I appreciate it. And Discovery Park of America it doesn't get better than that. I can tell you. I Amen to that. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.